So we've just finished discovering why Lagrange's theorem is true, that for any finite group, and for any subgroup inside of that group, that that subgroup's cosets are going to arrange the group's elements into this wonderful rows by columns format, that the cosets of that subgroup are all going to be disjoint copies of that subgroup that all have the same number of elements. And therefore, Lagrange's theorem is true, that the order of that subgroup must have been a divisor of the order of the whole group. So it's important to know what Lagrange's theorem says. It's one of the most important results in all of the theory of finite groups. But it's also important to know what Lagrange's theorem does not say. In this video, let's take a look at why the converse of Lagrange's theorem is actually false in general. So first of all, what do I mean by the converse of Lagrange's theorem? Well, if you think of Lagrange's theorem as saying every subgroup of G has order which divides the order of G, the converse I'm thinking of is the statement that if you hand me a divisor of the order of G, that there exists some subgroup whose order is equal to that divisor. So for example, um, if you hand me a, a group of order 36, you might ask, well, is this group of order 36 going to have a subgroup of order 18? Or is it going to have a subgroup of order 4? Is it going to have a subgroup of order 2? Just being a divisor of the order of the group does that guarantee that there exists a subgroup with that many elements? This statement was true in the case of cyclic groups. You hand me a cyclic group of order 36 and ask me, find a subgroup of order 9. I can do it because I can find an element of order 9, namely 4 if it's z mod 36, and then the cyclic subgroup generated by that element is going to have order 9. So for cyclic groups, this converse was true. But we want to understand why in general, for general groups, this need not be the case. I'm just going to establish one counterexample in this video. Let's go back to A4. That's my subgroup of 12 even permutations of four elements that we see down here. One of its subgroups is this cyclic subgroup generated by 1, 2, 3, the 3 cycle. That's a subgroup of order 3. 3 divides 12. But my claim is that A4 does not have a subgroup of order 6, even though 6 is a divisor of the order of the group 12. But this is the kind of proof that drives group theorists up a wall, because we have to do some pretty inventive reasoning to show why this cannot happen. So let's start by assuming that it does. Let's suppose that H was a subgroup of order 6 inside of A4. It would be not only a subgroup of order 6, it would be a, a subgroup of index 2. Right? I have six columns in this diagram, and there are two rows. So this is an index 2 subgroup, if you like. If it existed, that's what we would say. We know for sure that if H is a subgroup, that must mean that one of its elements is the identity element of A4. So we'll put the identity element there. That's got to be there because H is a subgroup. So what else can be in this subgroup H? Let's take a look at the orders of some elements. So the, we know the orders of all the elements in A4 are either 1, 2, or 3. If there were an element of order 6 in A4, then this statement here would actually be true. I could just take the cyclic subgroup generated by that element of order 6, and it would be a subgroup of order 6. But the orders of elements in A4 are only 1, 2, and 3. There's one element of order 1, the identity. There's two elements of order 3. Those are the 2 plus 2 cycles, this one, this one, and this one. And every other element of A4 is an element of order 3 because it's a 3 cycle. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 of them. There's 8 elements of order 3. So let's think about which of those elements can fall into my subgroup H. Let's suppose that I pick up an arbitrary element of order 3. It happens to be a 3 cycle in A4. So let me pick up a 3 cycle. Let's assume A is an arbitrary 3 cycle. I'm going to make the claim that that element A has to be an element of this subgroup H. Why is that true? Well, suppose that it's not. Suppose that one of my 3 cycles manages to live in this white row the coset of H, which is not equal to H itself. Suppose that it lands there in AH. So then what can I say? Well, where is A squared going to reside? So suppose that A is this 3 cycle 1, 2, 3, just for example. Right? Suppose 1, 2, 3 lives in this white row, not a part of H. Well, where is its square, which happens to be 1, 3, 2? Where's 1, 3, 2 going to be? Well, there's two choices. Either a squared is going to belong to H, 
or it's not going to belong to H. It's going to belong to the same coset AH. Right? In the case where A squared belongs to H, then A to the fourth will also belong to H because it's A squared times itself, and H has the closure property. So if A squared is an H, then A squared times A squared also has to be an H. But A was an element of order three. And so the fourth power of A is the three plus first power of A, but those three powers of A are going to become the identity. So A to the fourth is the same thing as A itself. And since we already assumed that A didn't belong to H, it can't also then belong to H. That would be a contradiction. Therefore, since A squared belonging to H necessitates A belonging to H, we conclude that A squared doesn't belong to H. Therefore, A squared must belong to the other row. Now, I've colored it green. A squared must belong to the coset AH. But if A squared belongs to AH, that means A squared is equal to A times some element of the coset H. It's equal to A times something highlighted in purple. Right? But I can rearrange this equation to solve it for A, just by multiplying by A inverse on both sides, to find out that A is actually then equal to H, and therefore A must have belonged to H in the first place. So we've arrived at a contradiction. So if A didn't belong to H, then A must belong to H. So clearly, the statement A belongs to H cannot be sustained, and the statement A doesn't belong to H cannot also be sustained. Therefore, we've arrived at a contradiction of this original assumption that there exists a subgroup of order H, or rather, that every element of order 3 must belong to that subgroup. So what we can conclude at this point is that every single element of order 3 in A4 has to belong to this subgroup of order 6. But now you can see the problem. There isn't enough room in a subgroup of order 6 to contain all of the order 3 elements, because there's 8 of them. And therefore we've contradicted the original assumption of the existence of a subgroup of order 6. So therefore, this converse of Lagrange's theorem is in general not true. We cannot expect, as we did with cyclic groups, that any divisor of the order of a group is going to have a subgroup realizing that order. It was true for cyclic groups, but it's clearly not true in general as this counterexample shows. So Lagrange's theorem only goes the other way. If I already have a subgroup of G, then its order must divide the order of G. If I don't yet have a subgroup and somebody just hands me a divisor, I might not be able to find a subgroup that has that order. And so that's the, the converse of Lagrange's theorem is not true, even though the forward direction is true. In our final video, we want to look through some other consequences. What is the fallout from Lagrange's theorem? What else can we deduce by knowing that the order of any subgroup of a finite group is a divisor of the order of the whole group?